Well, officially, welcome to our DIY seminar today. Something we like to do every year for our customers. Last year we canceled it. This year we decided that we we're going to try to have it in an outside environment. A lot of interest for it. Thank you all for showing up. We're our seminar today is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be how to install a wall. The second part is going to be how to install a patio. Um, we're going to try to keep it um, brief. It's going to take about two hours to get through it. We could make it longer, but we're not going to. So we've done some preparation beforehand because we're going to be working with, I'm going to teach, and these folks are going to do the work and teach you how. So little introduction, my name is Keith Eby. Um, if you frequent this place, you see me often. I'm the owner here, my wife and I, bought this business from my family in 2018. Um, they have the sawmill out in Beans Cove. So um, that's who I am. Our install crew today is Carter's Lawn and Landscape. Sean Carter is the owner, two good helpers, Chris and Corey. So main guys, <laughs> not the helpers. You're the helper, they're the main guys. Glad we got that right. The things that we're going to talk about today, the wall and the paver installation work as a system and there's multiple components to it and that's why it is beneficial to speak about them. And when you have your own project that you'd like to do, it's always helpful if someone can show you how to do that. So that is what we're going to do today. We're going to teach you and show you and at the end of the, the class, you're going to be able to go home and do it yourself, or you're going to realize that the project is more than you can do. And of course, you could take one of his cards and contact him later. We're going to first start with the wall building. Um, our area has a lot of hills, and it seems like about everyone could use a wall somewhere on their property. And we sell a lot of walls because of that. But walls um, look simple and easy when they're standing but there's some components to making them work that are very important because you've probably all seen walls fail um, they fall over even small walls fall over and there's a reason for that and we're going to teach you today how to install it properly so they don't fail for you there are kind of four steps to each of these um, parts whether it's the wall or the paver installation you have your materials needed you have your um, layout and scope of the project. You have your base preparation and you have your installation of the product. And we will step through all four of those parts to the installation of the wall and the patio. We're going to start with the wall, first of all. And we have prepared a spot here. Um, this is. No, no one has a place at their own house like this where they're going to build a wall. They're going to have a bank like that or some other type of situation. And there are a couple reasons for the need for a wall. Um, it may be that you're replacing a failing railroad tie wall. It may be that you want to add an existing parking area or a patio or maybe you're building on the side of a bank and you need to get a flat area. There's a lot of reasons for um, needing a wall and you when you're when you're thinking about your project you need to ask your question what what is this wall going to do because there are a couple different products to use depending on the need that you have sometimes people build walls just for privacy or for seating or for decoration and we have different products for that so when you when you think about your project you've determined um, what the need is, there are some materials that you're going to need for your wall. You're obviously going to need um, the block themselves. You're going to need um, crusher run for the base. You're going to need 57 gravel to fill the blocks and to put behind it. You're going to need possibly geogrid, um, separation fabric, drain pipe. There's going to be a number of materials needed and you're going to see us demonstrate them through this seminar. 
once you have once you understand the materials that you need um, and then you look at the situation that you have you're going to need to excavate for your wall um, basically every wall project requires excavation and you can do it with a pick and a shovel that is very doable these folks typically use a mini excavator and equipment to do it but you can do it with a pick and shovel as well and we'll have these hand tools here for you to use um, you also need a way to level the block as you build them and you can either use a string level or, or, or a laser transit um, you're going to need some hand tools to to um, to put the block down um, shovel a lot of those are simple basic things we do rent a couple things here we rent the compactor that you see here um, we also have a hand tamper we have a saw a couple things that we have here to help homeowners with their own projects so I'm going to step into the actual um, installation of the wall um, we have prepared this base here um, in your situation you're going to most likely have a raw um, raw dirt virgin soil perhaps and you're going to need to excavate out for where the wall goes and you're going to want to remove all of your topsoil and perhaps some of the subsoil depending on the situation um, this wall requires that you use at least six inches of a crusher run base like we have here and sometimes we use some stone dust for leveling the block and then often at least part of the bottom course is buried so when you're excavating you need to figure those things in consideration because you're going to need to dig a ditch that's at least 9 to 12 inches deep 6 inches for the base a couple inches for the block and your your ditch is going to need to be a minimum of 18 inches wide up to 2 foot that gives you a little room to play with your block gives you room to run your compactor down the ditch and that needs to be thought out before you start your excavation. Um, there, there are a number of considerations when you're looking at your project. Um, the excavation that needs done, um, perhaps a lot of material needs moved, and then there's also the consideration is where does the water, where is the water? Um, that's a, that's perhaps one of the most important considerations because the number one reason walls fail is because of water and water is our friend and water is also our enemy and you may think well I have no water um, but you need to think about the the yearly cycle of your property because in the springtime we have springs come out of our banks so we don't think about through the summer and through the rest of the year so is there a wet spot in this area in the springtime that's important um, it's also important to think about when when you have rain how does the water flow on your property um, <clears throat> because if water flows during a heavy rainstorm where your wall is it could easily knock out the wall that happened to my neighbor's property we had a we had a big storm the water came across the road and knocked over his wall so where is the water in the proper it, where is the water on your property and in this area and there are steps that you take to keep the water from harming your wall either you swale the ground behind the wall you install you always install a drain pipe behind the wall to remove any excess water but where is the water is the important thing if you actually have a, a spring you're going to want to deal with that before you um, install your wall so on your property you have determined um, where you're going to put the wall the dirt that needs removed and you have now um, dug a trench um, approximately 18 to 24 inches wide and 9 to 12 inches deep and we recommend that you run a compactor or a hand tamper down that ditch after you've excavated and that compacts the subsoil and then there is a fabric that we sell called separation fabric that you want to line the ditch with before you put your first gravel in it and the reason for that is that the, the fabric separates the subsoil from the base gravel that you put in. Um, this fabric looks like this. It's a woven heavy duty fabric. 
you lay it down in the ditch up both sides and then you put in your gravel and you'll want to um, put in your gravel in thin layers and compact each layer as you put it in. You can't just dump it all in and pack the top. You want to compact from the bottom up. Otherwise your gravel won't be compacted. And the purpose for compaction is to remove two things, air and moisture out of the gravel. And once you have done that, then that will be a stable base for your wall. And that's an important a very important thing for your wall to function is to have a good base. A lot of walls fail because they don't have a good base. Someone thought, I'll just sprinkle a little sand on the dirt, I lay my block on, it'll be nice. And it looks nice for a year or two and then it falls over and they don't know why. You need a good base. And so here you're going to need to imagine that this is a ditch and that we have put in the fabric and the gravel and we're going to do an L-shaped wall here. The reason for this is to show a number of different parts of the wall. We're going to show the base layer, we're going to show a corner, two corners, an inside and an outside corner, and we're, we're going to also show you how to cap off the wall. So we are at the point where we have dug the ditch, put in the fabric, the gravel, um, and we're ready for the base layer. And these gentlemen are going to put down a little bit of stone dust and lay the base layer of block for it. Yes, while they're doing that, I'm going to talk about needing to have your base level. The base course is, the, is going to take you the longest to put in because the base, will ref the base course will reflect itself the whole way up through the wall and you're going to need to have it level and each block level on that bottom course. If you have a laser transit, it's easy to determine if it is level. If you do not have a laser transit, you can use things like a four foot level, um, a string level, using a tape measure to determine whether you're base gravel is level. This is a laser transit. It hooks to its base over here. They'll set it at the level that they want and then they can go around and check every place on the wall to know that it is level. Most homeowners don't have this. I believe American Rental rents them. Um, but if you can't get access to a uh, transit, you can always use the old fashioned way of a string um, level and a tape measure. Some folks like to use um, stone dust for their for all of their base. Stone dust is a good product to use for leveling your top course, but it's not stable enough to use for all of your base, even though it's the easiest product to use because it's all fine It's the easiest product to use because it's all fine material. Crusher Run is what is used under the road, the um, is used for the road beds for our, our road um, system. And it is stable because it has large pieces and small pieces together that compact very nicely. And that's what is recommended to use for your base under your wall as well. So you'll see how they are leveling for their bottom course. They like to use two pipes and then screep the stone dust between them, which makes for a nice leveling bed for your first course of blocks. Is there any questions that you have at this point? Yes, sir. So that's a good question. How deep do you need to go for the depth of your retaining wall? You're going to need a minimum of six inches of crusher run under your wall. And if you need to bury part of a bottom course, you're going to have to add that measurement on as well. So we're using six inch block here today. If we bury half of that bottom row, that's three inches. So you're going to need an, to excavate a total of nine inches down 
to start your gravel. Now, how much you bury the bottom course is determined by the height of the wall and also the amount of dirt that you're holding back and the toe slope in front of the wall. If, if the ground is level and you're not holding back much, half of a block is sufficient. But if you're holding back a huge bank of dirt and the ground slopes away drastically in front of the wall, you may need to go two, three, or four courses down to have enough toe hold to withstand the pressure of the dirt behind it. So there's some variations in that. We're, of course, going to focus on a simple wall today. If it would be something more complex, you may, that may require an engineer to help you know what it would take to actually hold back that big of a bank. Minimum of nine inches of excavation. It is. Pipes, so the question is, are the pipes a good idea to level the bottom course? And the answer is yes. Um, you can use other material. You could use, you know, pieces of wood or anything that will give you some long um, stability. That way you don't have to, me um, you don't have as much variation in your base. So what these gentlemen would do is take their, um, transit and they would put it on their pipes to determine that the pipes are level and then when they screep the stone dust between it each um, the, the leveling bed is very nice. So, but if you're building on a slope, in other words your wall is going to slope down say along the driveway or something like that, you're going to have to have a step down, right? Yes. So if, if you are building a wall where it is on a slope the direction of the wall, you're going to need to step the wall. And so you'll have to envision your situation on how long can I run a level course because the blocks require, are required to always run level. You don't run them up a bank. So you would excavate out maybe 10 feet, maybe 20 feet level, and then you would go down another course and excavate an another level um, another level area. So you'd have to work section by section. No, because it's determined by the the contour of your ground. So those are all variables. If it's super steep, the sections are going to be very narrow. If it's just a slight grade, the sections could be long. And you would always start at your bottom most part and work up. You can't work down. You have to start at the bottom of the hill, level that out, put in your gravel, build your course, and then dig into the bank and work your way up. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, how deep would you excavate for a set of steps in front of a home? Um, <coughs> sure. So that would be the minimum requirement at that point, which would be at least half of that bottom course needs buried and you need six inches of gravel underneath. Um, that's an interesting question. One, there, there is an added dimension when you're working beside a home, and that is that often the backfill around a home is not stable. Contractors have a, a bad habit of throwing their junk alongside the foundation of a house, push the dirt in, and walk away. The Mr. Homeowner, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner decide they want a pretty set of steps to the front door. They build it. Two years later, it's falling apart. And it wasn't that they didn't build it properly. The, the problem was that the ground was not stable underneath of it. And so that's an important determination of is the ground stable? And perhaps if the home has been there for many years, it is. If it's a new home, sometimes you actually have to excavate down along the foundation of your home and start with good gravel and build it up so that your set of steps will last. Because if this is installed properly, it'll last lifetimes because the product doesn't wear out. Thank you for that question. Any other questions? I'm going to talk just a little bit about this block. There are different types of block for different purposes. Um, we are using what's called the terrace wall here today for two reasons. 
One is it's a 50 pound block, which makes it easier for us to lift. Um, we also sell an 80 pound block, which makes for a lot of back aches. So when I'm working with homeowners, I bring up that point to them because sometimes we choose the 50 pound block, even though it's more expensive because it's easier to deal with than the 80 pound block. So we, we're using terrace wall because that's a common block that you would use. We're also using this block because it's a retaining block. It has a rear lip on the back that you can see right here. Each row will set back the amount of that lip um, as it comes up to retain the dirt behind it. Some walls that are just decorative or for a seating wall, they will stack vertically with no lip. But we're going to show you a retaining wall. That's why we're using this particular block. This block here is the corner block. It's faced on two sides, this side and this side, and they will use it for an outside corner. Um, this is the cat block. It is the same length of a regular block, but it is rectangle, faced on the front, three inches thick, half the thick of the block. And we will use all three in our installation today. You men ready to put down the first course? Okay. Yes. On the bottom course, we typically knock this lip off so that the block sets level. If you don't knock it off, you need to pound it into the ground, which is difficult. So you'll see them go along and knock the lip off the bottom course before they set them in. These fellows do this for a living, and they're good at it, and you'll see that. Um, don't be discouraged when you're doing it yourself if it takes you a long time, because it just doesn't go that quickly when you're doing it yourself. You see, I don't know if all of you can see it or not, but they have snapped a chalk line on the stone dust, and that helps them to align the block the first course easily. So they'll go along and they'll lay the block in with the back to the chalk line, and then they will go along with a small level, and they'll level each block front to back and side to side. You may wonder why the side of the block is tapered, and that is to allow the block to be used for a radius. This block is very versatile, and um, if, you're, if your wall requires you to do a partial radius, it can be used for that without any cutting, um, just like you can for a straight wall. How would you set up your radius so that you had a smooth A garden hose is an easy thing to use. Lay out a garden hose and then paint along it. Eyeball it up. Your eye, your God gave you good eyes to, uh, that looks a little cockeyed or that looks nice. You know. This is called an inside corner. We just tee the one block into the other. Um, and each of those blocks, each of those layers will overlap each other as they come up. And that makes for a very strong part of the wall because they're bracing each other. On this is an outside corner. You'll see the, um, the, the end as well as the face of the block. On this and over here, they'll curve it um, to, the, to the left and show you how that is done. There are multiple ways to end a wall. Um, you can end it with a corner block like is there, or you can make it disappear into the bank of dirt. Um, is one way better than another? Not necessarily. It's what you would prefer yours to look like. Any questions about what they're doing? Yes, ma'am. No mortar needed. And I should have explained this at the beginning, and I'll explain it now. These blocks um, are called SRWs, Segmented Retaining Wall Block. And 
the, the value to them is that they can flex. If a wall is made from poured concrete, it can't flex. It will just crack. These blocks are allowed to flex because they're individual units and they can move individually from each other. So that is why our base does not need to go below frost level. If someone is building a wall and it's going to be a concrete block wall with mortar, they dig down below the frost level, pour a footer, lay their block up. And the reason is, is that above the frost level, when the ground freezes, it moves. And that wall cannot move or it'll fail, and so they go below the frost level. This wall system here is designed to flex with freeze thaw. It, it's fine if it moves with freeze thaw. It just needs to move together. And that's why we have a good base layer of gravel. As long as it has a good base of gravel so the wall moves together, it can go up and down a half an inch, quarter of an inch every winter and, and summer, and, and the wall will stand. So no mortar required. Um, it'll, your retaining wall block will either use a lip with the concrete. Sometimes they use pins. Um, and both of those allow for a slight movement of the block without it, it harming it. The top layer of caps will use a strong concrete adhesive to glue the, cla glue the caps down. We also use that on the corners where there isn't a lip. So we address that with the drain pipe behind the wall and I'll talk about that shortly. Here you can see they're leveling the block from side to side and from front to back. They use what's called a dead blow mallet. Um, you can't use a regular hammer, it'll just chip the block. You need a plastic style hammer. Um, you can buy them from any hardware store, Lowe's, True Value. It's called a dead blow hammer. They often have a little metal shot inside to help you with, with when you're hitting. Um, front to back, side to side. And you want to start and you want to keep your level moving the whole way through your wall. You can have each block leveled front to, front to back and side to side, but if it's a quarter inch lower than the block beside it, it's not helpful. So you need to it's nice to have like a 12 inch level and then a four foot level. That way you can use the 12 inch from front to back and you can slide your four foot. They have an eight foot, I believe, an eight foot. We also use a string to make sure that the backs are lined up as well. No. No lip because it lays across another block. That's where we would use adhesive to fasten it together instead of a lip. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I will answer that question by showing it to you. You want to install this? Well, yeah. So the foundation under the wall is extremely important. Second to that, or equal to that, is the drain pipe behind the wall. Remember I said when you're thinking about your project, you ask the question, where is the water? Um, and we always prepare for water, and we use the drain pipe for that. And this is called four-inch perforated drain pipe. There are little holes all through this pipe. And what this pipe does is it, is it gives you the confidence that there is a cavity behind the wall that water can escape through. If you don't have this, you don't know whether water will be able to escape out or not. And even though you may be doing this in the summer when there's no moisture, most likely through the, through the whole season, there's going to be moisture in that dirt. And this guarantees that the water can enter it and can flow to where it can exit. Um, 
if the wall is long, it's recommended that you have an exit every 25 to 30 feet. That way, if there is a larger volume of water, that there's plenty of space for it to exit without causing pressure behind the wall. When water is behind a wall, it produces something called hydraulic pressure, and it also makes the ground unstable behind it. And combining those together will easily knock over the wall. And so behind the wall, you have your first course that's below grade or partially below grade. And so it's recommended that this course go, this, that the, the drain pipe go at the second course. And the reason is, is so that when you daylight it, wherever you daylight it, it is above ground level. If you put it below your bottom course and you don't daylight it, the water can't escape. So you want to do this at the course where it'll come out above ground. And you will simply put it at the bottom, or you'll put it at that level behind the wall. And if the wall's small, you can just bring it to the end and let it come out to the side of the wall. If the wall's long, you'll want to bring it through the face of the wall every 25 to 30 feet. And that is what this part here is used for, and it's called a drain pro. This was designed so that it can come through the face of the wall every 25 to 30 feet. And the way it works is we use a T. The T goes over the drain pipe like that. The, I'm sorry. The T goes over the drain pro. You would need to use a short section of pipe between the two so that they would connect. This is designed to go inside of the four inch so you need a little bit of drain pipe to make it connect. And then, so it would go like this. I do not because you will cover this up with 57 gravel. Um, is it right or is it a good thing? It doesn't hurt, but the gravel around this keeps the small um, soil particulates from going in it. So let's do this. You'll grab that in, Chris. Let's do it. Let's do it right there. Here we have the drain pro, behind it we have the drain pipe running. Now you may ask why is this two inches too high? It's designed that way so that it can be used with the eight inch block and the six inch block. If you're using it with the six inch block, you would just cut it right off flush. So it's versatile. The drain pipe runs behind it and when you're building the wall, you have your crusher run underneath the block, but in the block and behind the block, we use a different gravel and it's called 57 gravel. And the difference between Crush Run and 57 is that Crush Run has everything from the finest gravel to like a three quarter inch gravel. It compacts, water does not go through it very well. 57 gravel is what you're sitting on right here. It's a variation of, of half inch and three quarter inch gravel with no fines in it. And what that does is it allows water to go down through it and um, it is still stable. So when we're building these walls, behind the wall itself, we fill the, va the cavity with the 57 gravel. That allows any moisture in the dirt to access the drain pipe that we've put behind it. We also use the same gravel to fill in the cavities as we're building the wall for two reasons. When you put this in the cavities, it adds weight to the wall. 
which increases its ability to retain dirt. It also provides for more interlock between your block. So when you have filled these courses with gravel, if, for, if perchance one of those lips would crack a little bit, the gravel between the blocks would lock it together. So it does two things. Behind the wall, it provides a way for water to get to the drain pipe, and it also is a freeze-thaw barrier that allows for the ground to move a little bit and protects it from the wall. The whole, all the way to the top, except maybe the top six inches if you want to put um, some mulch or something to, but yes, 12 inches minimum behind the wall, whole way to the top, in the block and behind it. It's important that you fill it, the, you fill that in as you bring up the wall. I've had some folks that have tried to build the wall and do that later, and the wall will fall over because each, each row sets back and if you don't stabilize it with the stone behind it and in it, you run the chance of your wall falling over. So you want to um, fill the stone behind the wall and in the courses as you bring it up to the top. Um, now there is another product that is used to help your wall function and that's the GeoGrid. And GeoGrid is a woven, um, is a strong um, woven product that ties your block into the dirt behind it. For anyone that is familiar with, that's a little better. For anyone that is familiar with railroad tie walls, they would use what's called a dead man, which was a tie that ran, that ran into the bank, and that helped to stabilize the wall. We don't use that anymore. We use a product like this, which, which does the same, um, which works for the same purpose. Now, this product is not required for walls that are under three foot, according to the manufacturer. Once you reach the three foot height and higher, you want to consider this as an important part to, your, to, the, to the piece. And the reason is, is that at that point, you need to help s stabilize the dirt behind it, as well as tie in the wall as you're building it up. And this needs to go horizontal behind the wall, le I mean level, so you wouldn't you wouldn't run it. This is the reason why you need to put the stone in behind the wall as you come up because it can't go down below the wall. The wall would move before it get tight. When you install this, you want it to be level from the front of the wall to the back of the dirt. They're demonstrating it here right now. Obviously, we don't have it backfilled, but you need to imagine that yourself. You put it between the two layers of block and then it runs level into the bank behind it. So if your wall is tall and you know that GeoGrid is going to be required, that goes into your consideration of how much excavation needs done because sometimes you need to do more excavation so you can install the GeoGrid. And sometimes the thought is, well, that ground is undisturbed. I'm going to risk it. Well, you don't have a way to tie your block into the dirt behind it. And so if you build the wall without it, someday it may need it and it's not there. So um, for the rule of thumb for general walls is, is that your geogrid needs to be 60%, the length of the geogrid needs to be 60% of the height of the wall. So if you're doing a wall that's six foot high, your geogrid should be four foot deep. If your wall's eight foot, six foot deep geogrid and, and on up. But at some point in there, if the wall is more than perhaps six foot, you probably should have it engineered so that you know how much geogrid to utilize. Because if, this, if, the, if you're retaining a lot of weight, perhaps there's a parking lot behind it or something of that nature, um, you would use a lot more geogrid than just a standard earth bank. That is dependent on the height of the wall. So on a three foot wall, maybe one row would be enough. Um, four foot wall, perhaps two. Um, that varies, uh, an engineer is going to determine that based on the quality of the soil on the site. So there's some variations of, of that. Kind of a rule of thumb that I use is after the second course and every three courses after that. Um, so 
depending on how many courses your wall is, it may be two, three, four rows of GeoGrid. Any other questions? Where are we at? The wall's done. We got to cap it. So that, that is a good question. How do you install a set of steps into the wall? The answer is, is that you're going to either use the corner block or you're going to you're going to radius the block into it. So you'll see two demonstrations here in our displays. Um, the one that goes from the office down to the mulch, it's radiused in. Over by the um, pergola, we have one where we use the corner blocks. Either way can be used, but you need to build the stairs when you build the wall. It can't be done later unless you build the steps in front of it. So that's part of your um, of the layout and scope of your project and if you're going to build in a set of steps you immediately start building that in each row that you come up and then it needs extra excavation because your steps are going to go back in the bank behind it so but it's it is daunting if you um, not not so much because the corner makes a strong part in the wall so when it's going back into the bank you have two corner two walls that are stabilizing themselves so um, you typically use a geogrid in your long walls but in steps they aren't really necessary mm -hmm. good question any other questions Yeah, I do that for customers all the time. Yes, you call me. Like <laughs> yes, often it is, depending on the, the size of the wall, but we're happy to figure that up for you. How much crusher run, how much 57. The difficult part I have is I never know if you go by those calculations when you do it then. <laughs> so it may figure up as six ton of one and two ton of the other, and you come back and you say, that was only half enough gravel. Well, if the bank tapers behind it and you put in two foot of stone, yes, it's not going to be enough. But we're happy to help you with those figures. Simple math, but it's for folks that do it every day, it's easier to do than if you don't. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm just looking at it right back here again. This pipe is off the ground, so that's what you're you're talking about. Yes, yes. You bring, your, you bring your truck up, and up to the bottom of the pipe and then just kind of level it or kind of slope it to the ground. Yes. And then from the truck up, you got your pipe, then you put your 57s on top of that. Okay, so under the pipe would actually not be the 57s. It would be that's right, because you don't want the water. This would be, this will come out at your ground level, your ground level road block. It won't be. So yes, be backfilling behind that first row, you can use crusher run so that the water stops at the drain pipe instead of going down into the ground below it. Before we do that, um, I'm just going to show you here the the adhesive. When I first started working here and they talked about using glue for block, my thought went to the glue you used in school and I thought how can glue work with block? Well, there is adhesive been, um, there's, this adhesive has been um, produced that is extremely strong. In fact, it's stronger than the aggregate of the block. When you glue these blocks together and you go to prime apart later, you'll probably break out part of the block before the glue um, gives. So it is a very safe and proper thing to use when you're building walls. If there's, if a, there's not a lip or a pin and you need the block to be hooked together, you use a concrete adhesive. And it comes in small tubes for a regular caulk gun as well as bigger tubes for a contractor that wants, needs to use a lot of it. So that's what this material here is. And in this case, we would use it on the corner here between these two layers we would also use it underneath the cap and we would glue each cap a couple daubs per cap it's nice to take the cap and 
and smear the glue a little bit so it goes into the pores so it holds better. Um, it doesn't take a super amount, maybe four spots per cap um, because it's very strong. So this is the concrete adhesive that is used um, when you build a wall. Trade you. One of the nice features to add to your wall is under cap lighting. And it, it does a couple of purposes. If the wall is near your house or along your driveway, you can put this lighting in, it lights up the wall. So as people pull in, they can see the wall. If it's close to your house, it might help you find your steps or walk into the house or just for sheer beauty. Easy to install. Each light goes underneath the cap. It looks best to slide your cap forward just a little bit when you're finishing up the wall, and that gives a place to tuck this light underneath. So the light goes underneath the cap, just like we have demonstrated there. The wire runs along the back side of it, and we hook it into a 12-volt transformer. Simple 12-2 wiring, um, landscaping wiring that you use for that. A transformer, 12-volt transformer that has a photo cell that turns on and off with dust to dawn and the ones that we sell also have a couple of hour increments so it could kick on in the evening and run for about four hours or six hours or eight hours and turn off or you can have it on from dust to dawn so it's a nice feature to add to the wall when you're thinking about your project um, any questions about that we're happy to show you how to hook them up if and when you buy them, it's not, it's not difficult at all. You know, there probably is. The question is, is there a solar version of the lights? One of the reasons that I have steered away from offering solar here is because when my customers purchase a wall and, and lighting, they often pay quite a bit for it. And when you have put a lot of money into your lighting and you pull in your driveway and it's not on, you're irritated and solar still runs off of sunshine. And so we like where the lights come on every night. And if you can plug them in, you're going to have that assurance. So I don't know, to answer your question, I don't know if there's solar lighting available for this. I know the little pathway lights there is. We always sell the ones that are hooked into the wiring. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good question. So the question is, do you need a, a um, gasoline powered compactor like we have here or can you hand tamp your gravel? The answer is you can hand tamp your gravel. The problem is, is that we typically get tired of hand tamping before we have tamped enough. And so if you rent one of these, we charge $45 a day. It's not a, not a large amount. It's easier to get the proper compaction. Um, but you still do need a hand tamper for corners you can't get in, um, too. So you still need a hand tamper for that. But even, even when you use a compactor like this, you still can only do la uh, layers of two inches. Two inches at a time. Yeah, we call them lifts. You put in your crusher run, level it out, compact it until it's hard to your heel. Put in another two inches, level it out, and compact it. So you would do three lifts until you'd be prepared for your base course. But yes, you can hand tamper. Pardon? With a hand tamper or without? No, the, the hand tamper, you probably should only do one inch at a time because you can't, you can't compact as hard. You maybe can, but you're going to wear out quickly. So with a hand tamper, I would make thinner levels, compact it, put thinner levels and compact it because you can't get the amount of compaction needed by just compacting the top layer. Do you want to break a corner? 
Do you want to uh, snap a cap? Maybe you should just carry it over there. Or are you on demo? What am I seeing? The light is on? Yeah. Wow, you have it plugged in. Can you see the effects of the light? They have a, a battery hooked to it in the back so that it's working. But you would probably space the lights about every 8 to 10 to 12 foot, depending on what looks nice. This here is a breaker or a block snapper. And we're going to demonstrate how we finish out the end cap to make it look nice. Again, this is something we offer free for our customers. You can come and snap the last cap if you need it. Adds a finished touch to your wall. Um, so rather than a clean saw cut, you need a more tractor. That's right. A clean saw cut, you can see that it's, it's cut. Whereas this will give the same face as the front of the cap. You need to turn that in. Can I show that to them? So this was the face of the cap. This is the end of the cap. Looks very similar. Looks very nice. And that's what we'll use for this corner right here. Nice touch. Yes, ma'am. Oh, good questions. Good question. The question the lady has is, what do you do with the mold or um, algae that grows on the face of these blocks? These, these, these systems take maintenance. Um, if someone says you're going to never have to do anything to these again, they're not telling you the truth. We find that a simple pressure washing once a year alleviates a lot of that problem of the mildew or or algae that grows on it. Um, it will grow back. It's the nature. We live in a world where things live and grow. So that's just some simple upkeep that you have to do to your wall. You also asked the question about weeds in your patio, and I'll probably talk about that in our next part where we do the patio. Um, thank you for those questions. Any others before we switch to the second part? Yes, sir. You may. Um, if you want to keep that perfect bond, you would want to trim your block. If you're doing a serpentine wall, the bond will get off anyway, and so it's not as critical. But it would be a preference. You, it's up to you whether you want to trim your block to make room for that drain pro or not. 10 o'clock, one hour for the wall. Any other questions? We're going to go right into building a patio next. But if you have any questions on the wall, we're happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. We, we will. We'll talk about the same thing with a patio because the, the, the stone, same material. What was the question? No. They, they removed the pipes, yes. The pipes were just for leveling the material. Once it's level, you pull the pipes out. You'll see us use them for the patio as well. Yes, ma'am. Depends on how long you want your pavers to look nice. 
So if it's just maybe two years, it's probably not worth it. But if you want it to last for 10 plus, you're going to want to. And the reason, I'll talk about that just shortly. The reason is, is that the way our soils are, they move. Every year with freeze and thaw, and you make a nice little area, two years from now, you'll say, what happened? Well, the soil moved, and um, because it's the finest particles, whereas the gravel here is much more stable and doesn't move like clay does. And so you can, once you do this, this patio will stay level for what do you want to say your patio is going to stay level for, Sean? 20 years? 30 years? Forever. Forever. <laughs> when it's done right. When it's done right. Yes. Yes. We sell a lot of bags. We also deliver this product, so we can dump it. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. They're 8 inches high and 18 inches long. They're equivalent to one and a half of these. So less block, cheaper for the, your whole wall, but heavier and more back aches. Good questions. Any other? So there will be nothing behind the wall? No. Nothing. It'll be more of a seating wall? Okay. So yes, I would not use this block for that. I would use what we call our seating wall block for that. And that's designed to go vertical with no setback. Um, so it's a different block, and I'd be happy to show that to you afterwards. But um, this block is specifically used for retaining wall. While they're working, I'm going to start talking. So the wall system that we described is a wall system. Foundation, block, drainage, grid, multiple things that make up the system. Now we're going to talk about interlocking concrete pavers, which are also a system. Um, there are multiple components together to make it work properly, and we're going to demonstrate those and talk about them. But first I want to say that this system is old. It's not something that we just discovered. In fact, the Romans built their roads this way. And that's why they, they understood this system and they implemented it. And that's why their roads have lasted for many, many years. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that some of those roads are still used today, a thousand years later. Why? It's because of the system that they used to work. And so does this system. If, if your patio fails, it's because part of the system was missing. And the, the system includes your base, your base below your, your, um, your pavers. It includes edge restraint, restraining the pavers. It includes a bedding layer below the pavers, as well as joint sand um, <coughs> between the pavers. The Romans understood that the base gravel needed to be compacted for the longevity of their roads. And they, they knew that um, sheep have the, the greatest weight per square inch on their feet. And so they would use a shepherd with a flock of sheep when they built their roads and he would lead his sheep down the roadbed to compact the, their, their base. So uh, today we have these large compactors that are called sheep's feet rollers. And they have little knobs on that punch the, um, the gravel. And that is similar to the old time Romans using um, sheep to compact their gravel. They also knew the importance of keeping their cobblestones tight together because the the pressure of the pavers together locks them and the the old story goes that that the um, supervisor would use the tip of his spear to determine if the stones were close enough together and if the, if he could push his spear down in between the stones the um, the uh, 
the man in charge of the work crew uh, lost his head. So that was their quality control. These, this system, wall or patio, is built on our soil. And soil is so important to the functionality of, of these systems. And in our area, we have a variety of soils. You may have clay on your property. You may have a gravelly soil. You may have a sandy soil. You may have what we call groundhog shale or, sh or slate on your soil, on your property. Um, and you need to take that into consideration. The worst soil possible is clay or silt. Um, and most of us have that. So when we go to build a patio, we're working off the worst soil. If you lived in a sandy place and had sand around, that's a good soil to build on. And so if I was teaching this class in Florida, I probably wouldn't talk as much about the base because their, their, sand, their ground is so sandy. But most of my customers are, are going to find clay soil on their property. And if you don't remove the clay and put in a good base, your patio is going to look awful in a short amount of time. And so, you, again, we are going to look at the materials needed. We're going to talk about the layout and scope of your project. And we're going to talk about the base preparation and the installation, those four basic steps as we did with the wall. So as you're thinking about your project, your, your scope, why do you want a patio? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Um, you may want it to give you more sp an outdoor living space. You may want a patio um, for a place to entertain your friends or around the fire pit, or maybe you want a, pa a, a, a paver driveway, or um, I've sold pavers for streets. Um, South end of Cumberland uh, on off of Pennsylvania Avenue, there's a housing complex that I sold the pavers for in their streets. And that was for a special situation where the water goes down between the pavers um, called permeable pavers. But you, you think about your project and, and um, determine what the patio is for. Again, the question is, is where is the water? Where's the water? Is, is this a soft area um, when it's wet? Does the water flow onto this area from, from my property? Does it come from my neighbor's property? Where does the water leave this? Because you, you need to answer those questions before you um, decide how you go build your patio. So you, you've decided this is the area for your patio. Um, it is, you have, you have topsoil underneath your topsoil, you have clay dirt and it's just not a good base for it. So you're go it's going to require excavation. And again, this can be done the hard way. I have customers that, that will dig out their soil by hand, wheelbarrow. You can do that. You can also utilize equipment. Either way, you achieve the same results. Um, below your patio you're going to have two components you're going to have your base gravel which is crusher run six inches of that and you're going to have one inch of a bedding sand which they've already started to put in which is concrete sand um, and so if you have a threshold that you're meeting perhaps it's your door on your house or maybe it's a, an outside building or a, a steps if you have a threshold that you're working off of um, you're going to need to excavate a minimum of, of nine inches below that. And the nine inches come from six inches of your crusher run base, one inch of sand, and then a typical paver is two and three eighth inches thick. So you add those numbers together and you come up with nine and one eighth inch. When you compact the pavers, they settle an eighth of an inch. So nine inches is the rule of thumb that we use. Um, once you have excavated out your topsoil and the, the amount of, of, of sub base that you have, you're going to want to start by compacting your sub base because it may have gotten disturbed by your excavation. So if you're running a compactor, run it across and compact that sub base. Um, and then we recommend, again, using that separation fabric underneath your base gravel between your base gravel and your subsoil not between your base gravel and your sand 
This goes between your base gravel and your subsoil. And the reason is, for, is this. Um, with free stall, our ground moves. And over time, if you do not utilize this, your six inches of base gravel will work into the, the subsoil and you may only be left with four inches of gravel 10 years from now. If we encapsulate this base gravel with this fabric, it'll never mix. So imagine you have your, your subsoil and then you have a layer of this fabric and then you have your base gravel. You can rest, you can have confidence that, that you will have six inches of base gravel indefinitely because they won't mix. If you don't utilize this, freestall is going to slowly erode your base. Now, there are times where you want to use more than six inches of gravel and that would be if it would be a driveway or or a, a heavy load bearing area. Um, typically for a driveway, we may go either with 12 inches or more of gravel, just so we have enough stability to handle that weight. You're so, not, using 57s at all. not at all. Now, could you use 57s under your crusher run? You know, possibly. I mean, you can, if you understand those gravels, you can utilize them together. But we use crusher run because we want the voids filled between the stones. We're not really interested in a lot of water going down through it because the water will run off the patio. Um, so we use crusher run because we want the voids filled because we will use a bedding sand. And if you would use 57s in your bedding sand, your bedding sand will go down into your stone because there are openings between the stone. So we recommend using this. I sell it on a 12 and a half foot wide roll and we cut it to length. So if you come in and say, Keith, I, I have an area 12 by 30, I need this, we'll go and cut it off for you. 11 cents a square foot. In the, in the long run of things, it's very cheap, and you have the assurance that your, your base will always stay intact. So once you have put this down, um, we also, I also recommend bringing it up the sides of your excavation. That way the stone can't escape out into your yard beside it or wherever. Um, bring it up the sides. Again, you're going to fill it with your crusher run gravel and you're going to compact it. And this is where you would want a compactor again for the ease of compacting it. Again, two inch lifts, no more than that with that size of compactor. If you have a big one, you can do higher lifts, but this typical walk behind compactor, you can only do two inches at a time and get the, the compaction that's needed for your project. So six inches you're going to need three lifts of two inches a time compacting between each layer until you get to the top of your crusher run. The other consideration for your patio is where is it going to slope? You need the water that lands on the patio needs to run off and we recommend a minimum of one inch of slope per ten foot minimum. If your pavers have a large texture to the top, you may even need to slope them more so the water runs off. Because if the water puddles on it, not only is it not nice for your patio, it's dangerous in the winter time for slipping, and then that adds for the water going down into your sub base and it's just not healthy. You want your water to run off the patio. So as you're, as you're um, preparing your base, you will need to think about the slope where you're going to slope it, um, and that can become very critical around a pool, um, or close to a house, um, different things like that. You have to think about where do I want this water to end. You don't want the water to run towards your house. You don't want it to run towards your pool. You may need to put in a, a, a floor drain to work with some of those issues, but you want the water to run where you want to, where, you, where it needs to go, so you need to put some thought in it ahead of time. Um, you also want your patio to be fairly level when you're done. And this, it's a, it's a time consuming part of it to get your patio level. If you watch these fellows when they level a patio, it takes a good bit of time because they'll run strings across it, measure down from the strings to make sure they have the proper base layer so that when they put the sand down and lay the patio, it's, this is what we wanted. So. Um, putting in the gravel, compacting it, and then making sure that top layer is where you want it. Because you can do a little bit of tweaking with your sand, 
but you don't want to get much more than one inch of bedding sand or else your pavers become unstable. Any questions up until this point? No. The bedding sand is uncompacted. Once you put the pavers on them, you will compact the pavers. Bedding sand is uncompacted. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Correct. Soil, fabric, crusher run, and then bedding sand. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So, I did the same. So, if you're doing a spot to the rest of that, that's like the great thing to do now. You know, the spot to start to stay in the middle of it and put it in. You know, where you want to put it. That would be great. Is your question, if there's standing water where I put my patio, how would I drain it? Yeah. Two questions. One is, is the water from an underground spring, or secondly, is it from runoff? If it's from an underground spring, I would dig down to find that spring and put in drain pipe and gravel to get the water elsewhere before I put my um, patio. Um, if it is from runoff, I would... I would swale it, take a mound of dirt, and, and run the dirt, run the water around the patio somehow so it doesn't come onto the patio. Basically, you only want the, the water on your patio to be the rain that lands on it. You don't want runoff from another property or another part to come on. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So the question is, would these same principles apply to a walkway as they do at a patio? And the answer is yes. Um, if you're doing a four foot walk to the entrance of your home, you would use the same principles, excavation, fabric, crusher run, one inch of sand. So we've eliminated, we, we've kind of skipped over the leveling process here because we don't want to make this take a lot long time. So when you're doing this, you're going to spend a lot of time making sure that this base layer here is level and is sloped the way you want it. Because once we're done, you're done. And your pavers always reflect what's underneath. So you would take a lot of time using a string level, tape measure, um, to make sure you have the proper slope to your um, patio. Then we like to use these pipes to get that one inch of bedding sand. Um, you, can, you can go to a hardware store and buy their, their three quarter inch metal conduit and end up with a pipe that's basically one inch outside diameter. Uh, makes it work very nice. You can also get a straight two before if you can find such a thing and use it as a screet instead of the aluminum screet. S achieves the same result. It's also nice to have a, um, a simple um, um, concrete trowel to level out any places that might get disturbed. Corey has one there in his hand. Once they have this leveled out, they will pick out those um, pipes and will fill in those cavities with sand and he'll level them out with his concrete trowel. Probably one of the beginning steps to your project is what paver do I want to use? And nowadays that the, the options of pavers are a multitude. It becomes daunting for me as a dealer to, de to, to know what to bring in as stock because there are so many styles, so many sizes, so many colors, textures, and we are used to many options and so we look through the catalog and we say, I want that. So um, that's one of the steps to, um, to your project is what paver, color, and texture do I want? We're, we're using, what we're going to use today is called the Old Town Cobble. And I use it for, for a number of reasons. It's been a popular paver for many years. Um, it comes in two sizes, a rectangle and a square. And they go together very easily for a beginner. 
um, it has a simple texture on the top. It also comes in the collars that my wall block come in. So if you're doing a, a, a wall of this collar, I also have a paver that matches it. And this is also the paver that I always stock. So if you come in and you say, I want something that you have in stock, I'm going to say, check out our Old Town Cobble. I'm happy to get in the other pavers for you, but there's often a lead time with them till they come in. Prep is very similar. If, if you would be doing a natural stone patio or walk, the, the preparation is very similar to that of concrete pavers. I've often found that my contractors like to use stone dust under the flagstone instead of sand, um, so that is an option. I do not recommend that under pavers because stone dust is a larger aggregate size than, than concrete sand, and the concrete sand actually comes up from the bottom of the paver and locks them together. So if you use limestone dust, you don't have that locking, um, that same locking. And also limestone dust tends to hold moisture and sand um, allows it to go away. But the process is very similar. You need a good stone base um, and then some type of a leveling agent for flagstone. Any other questions? One of the important considerations with the paver system is that they need to be restrained. So the, the, the Romans would use curb stone along their roads to keep the cobblestones from moving. Today, we use, uh, typically use a plastic restraint or sometimes a concrete product. And we're going to show you the plastic restraint today. Now, if your patio goes up against the foundation of a house or, or a, a sidewalk, a concrete sidewalk, or a road or something, that's going to restrain it. But if there's any part to the project that is not restrained, you need to restrain it so that these pavers work well. Um, the pavers have a bump on the side that spaces them properly. Years ago, we didn't have that, and sometimes they would use a penny or something to space them. Today, there's a little bump on them so that you put them together tight as you can and there will still be a thin joint between it. <clears throat> These are the two pavers in the Old Town Cobble um, style. We call this a six by nine, six inch by nine inch. This is a six inch by six inch. They're both two and three eighths inch thick, which is industry standard. Um, if you go to my competitor up there in LaVale, sometimes they sell thinner pavers for less money. Um, and you can get away with that selling a, a paver cheaper if you don't make it as thick. But industry standard is two and three eighths inch thick for strength. On the sides of the pavers are their little bump outs. And so you put them together, still leaves a little joint for the joint sand to go between it. The, the rectangle and square can be utilized for a variety of patterns. Um, a common pattern that we use is the eye pattern, which is what these folks are doing. Um, I like to use that pattern because it's repeatable, it's easy to do, and I can also figure out the proper amounts of rectangles and squares for you. Um, and, we, and we, we're happy to do that. It takes 70% of rectangles, 30% of squares. Um, once you start laying them, as you see, Chris is working on the patio itself. And the reason for that is so that he doesn't disturb his bedding sand. Once you have that bedding sand prepped, you want to stay off of it. And if, you are, are, and if you're only able to do a certain amount today, only put down that much sand. You don't want it to rain on your sand. Um, you want it to be freshly screeded when you put down your paver. So screed out enough sand for your patio. Start walk, working in the corner um, and then work on the pavers as you're laying them. 
And we use this term called click and drop. And if you hear him, you'll hear that little click as he's putting the paver down. When you click them together and then drop them, you know they're tight together. Any other questions at this point? You all have had a lot of good questions this morning. Appreciate that because I'm used to talking about these things and I skip over questions or thoughts that you have. And if you give them, it'll remind me. Do you have another question, ma'am? Good. Yes. Very good question. If we're building a raised patio, what do I fill in behind the wall? Do it, does it all need to be crusher run gravel? The answer is that you can fill in behind the wall with, with, a mater with any material that will be stable. Um, if you don't have good soil, you will want to use crusher run, some type of aggregate that is good. Um, in some situations, contractors will actually use a real low PSI concrete um, for behind a, for in a raised patio um, if they don't have good soil and it's hard to get to. But um, you could use a, a um, good sub-base type of soil as long as it's compacted, but I would still use six inches at the top of, of a stone base so that you have that uniform movement for your patio. Not if the patio is the same level as the wall and the water can run off the face. Question is, if you're doing a raised patio, do you need a drain behind the wall? And the answer is, if the patio is slightly higher than the wall so that the water will run out across the face of the wall, you don't need a drain behind the wall. If you're doing a seating wall around the patio, maybe you have a raised patio with a fire pit and a nice seating wall, the water can't go off the patio, you're going to want to implement a floor drain system so that the water doesn't lay on your patio. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So your the question is is what a patio but it's going to be on a little bit of a hill slope. You live basically on a lot of hills. You if you dug it out you could see it like a, a little bit of a trough in there and you might not want that in there maybe just take a little higher. Yes. You want slope for your patio. You, every patio you build, you want to have a certain amount of slope to it. The question is is how much is too much slope? Yeah. And the answer is um that's your determination. If you can't sit on your lawn chair on it without falling over, oh, that's yeah. probably too much slope. <laughs> that's right. So one inch per 10 foot is the minimum amount of slope. I've never tried to determine at what point is it uncomfortable to sit on, but somewhere in there, you're going to say, um, I wish my patio was not so sloped. Um, but I these. I want to know how much of a slope you would have uh, you know, for good drainage, and you just said one inch for ten feet. Yes, right? minimum. Um, I've seen these pavers used on a driveway with a steep slope. Again, they weren't going to sit on it with a chair, so it didn't matter. But the pavers can be laid on a slope for a driveway. Right, and you can put a car on top of that. Yes. These pavers are used for low traffic driveways. Um, we have sold them for that. If it was a street, or something like that, they make a thicker paver, three and one eighth inch thick for streets and roads. Um, yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. That paver is called a permeable paver and it is made with a large lug on the side. 
these two here have a very small lug so that when it's together it's a very narrow joint. That particular paver has a big thick lug so that when you put them together you still have a large joint. And that is for a particular reason when they did that um, when they did that housing complex there they were dealing with the runoff from the property and they discovered that the soil was permeable and would would absorb a certain amount of rain and so instead of taking part of the project and doing a large runoff um, drainage pond the engineer said that if you put in a street that is permeable the rain and what comes off the roof can go down through the the um, the pavement down into the soil so um, that's that is the type of paver that they use and underneath that paver is probably at least a foot of clean gravel and one of the reasons that it's weed free probably has to do with the traffic that's on it as well as with those pavers you don't use the poly sand you use a clean gravel and it, and it's harder for uh, a weed to grow in it yeah. Remember I said that it's important that these pa this paver system is restrained. And in this case, it's restrained on two sides with the wall, but on the other two sides, it's not restrained. And that's where we use this plastic paver restraint. This here goes against the paver. The be behind it has these holes for the spikes to go in. You want to spike at least every foot. Um, if you were doing a radius, you snip out the back so that it can bend. It's, it comes like this for a, for a straight course, but if it's a radius, you snip this out and bend it. It's also made so that each one hooks across to the other one, and a spike goes down between it. So you have, you have integrity between the different ones. You do not put this on top of the sand, though. So once they laid the pavers out, where the pavers stopped, they went along and scraped the sand away. The reason is, is the sand is unstable. You want this down on the crusher run base. It only has to catch the bottom half inch of the paver. It doesn't have to come up the whole way. In fact, when I walk along on a, on a patio or walkway and I can see this, I know that it proper, probably wasn't installed properly. It's probably on top of the sand because if it's put on the base, it's going to be an inch below the top of the um, paver. The other reason you want that is sun will make this black plastic move and you want this covered up with soil or mulch or something so that the sun rays can't get to this. Do you have a spike handy? Um, around eight to nine dollars a piece. Eight foot. Ten inch spike goes in that hole. The spike is designed so that it rusts because that's what locks it in. If you try to pull this up a couple years after you put it down, you won't be able to get it out because the, the rust has um, locked it into the soil and that's by design. There is another product available now that is a concrete mixture that has f fibers in it. So that instead of a plastic, you would uh, put this concrete mixture along. That's becoming more popular in the industry. Um, some say it works better. I don't know, but both are used. What if you want an edge block instead? You know, like an eight or nine inch edge block on there. How would you, how would you anchor that? How would you anchor the block? Yeah. Or would you need to? Um, would the block be retaining back some dirt or not?
That's a good question. The question is, is how do you run an edge stone along a patio? Do you need the edge restraint if you do that? Um, there could be a couple different ways of doing it. You could put the edge restraint on the back side of the, of the block. However you do it, you do not want your pavers to move because as soon as they start to gap, they lose their integrity. So you could put your block and the restraint on the back side and then fill the void in with poly sand. That could be possible. If you have seen a patio failure, generally you'll see a gap between the pavers because when these are locked together, they, they can withstand a lot of weight on top because they are pinched together. Um, if the pavers start to move away from each other, they lose their integrity, and then they start to move up and down. Other, starts, uh, other dirt starts to get in between it, and they, they, um, you lose your nice patio. So it's important that your pavers are locked in tight. Any other questions? Yes. A minimum of, a, of an inch on the bottom of the paver. Basically, so it holds the bottom of the paver. Edge restraint. Mm -hmm. So we have our crusher run base, we have our bedding sand, and we have our paver. We're almost finished, but there's one more thing that we need to do, and that is putting, put in our sand between the joints. Now, for many years, we just used mason sand because that's all we had. But mason sand uh, migrates out uh, when it rains. It, it moves it around. You track it into your house. And so the industry... Um, the last step is putting in the joint sand between the pavers. Yes, that is what finishes locking it together. If we would stop right now, those joints would get filled in with dirt over time, and then you're going to have a weed problem. What, um, the question earlier was, how do you prevent weeds in your patio? Weeds are very frustrating. Um, and using a good poly sand is one of the ways of preventing it. And sometimes my customers use poly sand and still have a weed problem and often that's because the poly sand wasn't used properly. The poly sand needs to be the depth of the paver. Um, some try to just use it on the top of the joint so that they don't have to spend as much for the poly sand. And it's designed that the whole joint is filled with the poly sand. And that poly sand is activated by water. So after you have put down your pavers, at this point here, Sean would take the compactor, and we're not going to do it because it's noisy. He would take the compactor, and he would come across those pavers with his compactor with a rubber mat on it so it protects the, the pavers. What that does, that vibration locks them together with the sand underneath, and they will settle that one-eighth of an inch that I talked about earlier. The pavers will settle that into the sand, and that is the way you want it. After he would compact it one time, he would get out the poly sand um, that he has there in a bag. It's a real fine sand that goes into the joints, and it is activated by water. So it's important that the sand is kept dry, and when it's dry, it's, it flows very easily. You need your pavers to be dry when you put this in, or else it'll stick to the surface of the paver. If that happens, you're going to come to me and you're going to say, Keith, after I was done, now my pavers look gray. What did I do wrong? Well, the pavers had moisture in them, and it activated the glue agent in the poly sand and stuck it to the surface. So you want your pavers to be dry. If it rained yesterday, I would not put poly sand in today because these pavers are porous, and they have mo the moisture can be in those pores, and they look dry, and they aren't. So you want your pavers to be dry, put the sand out, sweep it in the joints with a nice broom. Um, if, you have a, um, if you have a leaf blower 
or an air compressor where you can blow off the patio when you're done, that is helpful to get all that fine dust. If you use a coarse broom, you can have fine dust on your patio that you aren't thinking about, and then when you wet it, it sticks to the paver. Um, you also need to make sure you put enough water on it. One of the things I've learned is that, that my customers um, think a little water will activate it. I had one fellow that was using a small sprayer and he was misting it and it wasn't working. You need to put a lot of water on it. Now you can go to an extreme. You don't want a two inch rain on top of it. That's too much water. But you want to wet your pavers good because the sand needs to get moisture to the bottom of the joint and that's two and three eighths inch thick. If the if the sand isn't wet the whole way down, the only part that is wet will get solid. And if it's just a top quarter inch, a year from now, that top quarter inch will flake off. Underneath of it will be soft and your weeds will start to grow. So um, you want your joint to be wet the whole way down. There's a couple different ways to achieve it. I recommend that you put a sprinkler on a garden hose and wet your patio good until it puddles in the joints. Give it a couple minutes to soak in, wet it again good. Do it at least three times where you're putting enough water on the patio that's puddling in the joints and then letting it soak in. And then the last time that you wet it, take your hose and wash off the patio to the edge. That way if there's any joint sand laying on your pavers, it'll get washed off. If you do that, your poly sand should function properly. Now, having said that, poly sand isn't going to last as long as your pavers are. Probably 10 years, somewhere in there, you are going to have to replace it. And when you do, you're going to need to take a pressure washer or hire someone to do this, wash out the joints good before you put in more poly sand. You can't just put a quarter of an inch of poly sand in the joints and expect it to function right again. So these systems do take maintenance and something that down the road you're going to have to do is is redo the poly sand on it um, yes ma'am sure so we have two good questions here. Question number one is, do I recommend a sealer on these pavers? The second question had to do with efflorescence, and I'm going to talk about both of those. First, I'm going to talk about efflorescence. Efflorescence has caused many a, a, a homeowner or a new patio owner um, heartburn because they put this money in a patio and they come out one day and there's this whitish stuff on it and they're sure that they got something that was um, was bad from the factory. Something's wrong with my pavers. Um, some, some patio owners never see them, never see efflorescence. And the reason is that this whitish stuff that comes to the surface is the lime that is in the concrete that is made. And sometimes it comes to the top, other times you never see it. Um, typically, it weathers off. We call it an efflorescence bloom, where it'll come to the surface, our rain is slightly acidic. You allow it to weather for a season and it dissipates. Um, if it doesn't dissipate, we sell cleaner that helps to deal with it. Occasionally, occasionally we run into a situation where it's too stubborn and we have to replace the product, but that's, that's pretty rare. Um, however, if you want to seal your pavers, you want to wait until that time span of at least a year after you install it before you seal it. Because if you're going to see efflorescence, you're going to typically see it within the first six to 12 months. So if you want to seal your pavers, once your pavers are installed, wait a year before you have them sealed. The question is, is sealing recommended? Well, you seal pavers for a couple reasons. Um, one of them is to enhance the collar. So there is high gloss sealer available that takes these pavers and make them look like they're wet looking, which is a richer collar. 
some customers want that rich look and so that is a reason why they would seal the pavers. The other reason you would seal the pavers is for ease of cleanup. If you grill a lot on your patio and you spill drinks and maybe some grease off your grill and things like that, that'll soak into these pores and you'll have spots on your pavers that are different than when they're new. If you put a sealer on it, it'll, it seals up those pores and makes for ease of cleanup. Now, the problem with sealing is it's not as easy as we wish it would be. Um, it can be slightly technical and if you've put a sealer on your paver and it's not working properly, it's hard to fix the problem. One of the first um, eye-opening experiences I had with that was when someone sealed their patio late in the fall. And it was a beautiful day, but after they sealed it, the pavers looked, um, looked um, cloudy. It, it, it lost its vibrant color. Instead of being enhanced, it looked cloudy. And I came to realize that, that late in the fall, where that patio was situated, there was moisture in those pavers that they were unaware of. And the moisture was trapped under the sealer. So we had the fun of taking xylene, which re-emulsifies the sealer and allows the moisture to dissipate. So that was a learning curve that if you seal your pavers and they're damp, you're going to have a problem that you're going to have to fix. Um, the other thing is that sealers only last three years, maybe four years, somewhere in there, depending on the foot traffic and where. So once you start the process, figure on every three years that you're going to be resealing your patio. It's expense and time. Um, it won't make your patio last any longer. These pavers are durable. Sealing does not add to their longevity. It's not like blacktop sealing where um, if you seal your blacktop, it, it'll last longer. Not so with concrete pavers. What it will do is make for ease of cleanup and enhance the looks of it. Um, one of the th things that E.P. Henry offers now is pre-sealed pavers from the manufacturer. They have, they have um, come up with a way to add sealant to the paver at the time of manufacture. So that is what I recommend to a customer. If they want their pavers sealed, I recommend buying them pre-sealed. It's cheaper that way. The paver is more expensive up front, but to you buy the sealer and have someone seal it, it's cheaper to buy the paver pre-sealed up front. Good question. Is there a material to, that you should not put on pavers that will damage it? You do need to be careful with what ice melt that you use on this. You want to use an ice melt that says safe for concrete. Regular rock salt will ruin the paver and the reason is that it heats up the surface and, and the surface pops apart and, and you destroy the beauty of it. You want to use an ice melt that is safe for concrete, which, is a, which there are such things available. Um, as far as are there any other products that should not be put on it? Um, I'm not aware of any cleaner or any any um, thing like that that will harm it, but any any oily substance will soak into the pores and will be hard to clean out. So if it's a driveway and your vehicle has a small oil leak, it's going to be hard to clean that out. It's also hard to get rust off of it. So if you have patio furniture that is that is metal and is rusty, where it sits is probably going to make a rust mark. It is hard to clean rust off of off the patio. It won't make it not function. It won't wear it out. Rust won't. It'll just look ugly. The same with an oily substance. It won't hurt it as far as making it break or anything. It's just that you're going to have this dark spot that is hard to clean. Yes, sir. It, it, it's going to harm the surface where it's not going to look nice. Okay. Um, you're better off using a rust cleaner on the surface instead of 
a buffer or a polisher. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, the polysan is activated with water. So this is polysan, yes. There are different brands called different things, but this is polysan, meaning the sand has polymers in it that are activated by moisture. When, they, when the moisture is put to them, they coagulate together and, and solidify. Now, one thing that I learned is that the sand is designed so that it softens after it gets wet. So when you have a patio put in, if you come out after a nice rain and take and poke the joints, you'll find they're slightly soft. But as that moisture dissipates, they solidify again. So that's, that's something to know. Your, your, your product is performing properly, but that is a reality with it. Any other question? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> no, you don't. Um, I don't know what that lifetime expectancy is because that that <coughs> technology has just been developed. So we've only been selling them for about two years. So I don't know at what point you'll need to reseal them, but I would imagine at some point you will. Any other questions? Anything I missed, Sean? Did I? Well, thank you. We have tag teamed doing this for probably eight, ten years, quite a few times, and they're great to work with. Good point. One thing I did miss is when you're putting in the poly sand, you will want to tamp it between putting in the poly sand. What I mean by that is is if you put the poly sand in the joints and sweep it and then tamp it, it'll settle down in the joints. And then you need to put some more sand in. So you want to do that maybe two or three times before you know that your joints are completely full of sand. He has a tamper with a, with a poly bottom on it. We also have a compactor with a rubber base on on a, on a large patio, you would use that so it doesn't scuff up the surface. Well, we appreciate so much you all coming out. Hopefully I didn't put anyone to sleep. Hopefully you go away with a few things that you've learned. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming out.